Hello, everyone, and welcome to another program of Reptile and Amphibian Days at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Miranda Dowdy, and I will be your host for the program today, and we are doing something really exciting. We are going to see a live feeding of some of our venomous reptiles that we have here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Um, before I introduce you to our special guest for this program, I want to know, so in North Carolina, we have a total of six venomous snakes. I want to see if you combined, not individually, I want to see if you all can name all six species of venomous snakes here in North Carolina. All right. And so while you're coming up with those, I want to introduce you to our special guest. So on camera, you're going to see Kurt Frega and then You'll hear a disembodied voice behind the scenes um, holding the camera, and that is um, Shauna Joplin. And they are both curators of reptiles, amphibians, and ambassador animals with the museum. And so they get to do all that cool behind the scenes stuff, taking care of all of our live animals, and um, which is a very important and busy job. So with that, welcome to you, Kurt and Shauna. Cool. Uh, thank you. So, uh, like I said, my name's Kurt, uh, and the room that we're in right now, this is where we house all of our venomous reptiles that we keep here at the museum. So, if you were visiting the museum and you were on the third floor of the Nature Exploration Center and you walked past our exhibit of uh, Snakes of North Carolina, this is the area behind that exhibit. Uh, where we can keep some of our backup animals and where we can safely access the venomous exhibits without being on the floor around the public. Uh, in fact, if you look at some of these, uh, you might notice that these exhibits aren't necessarily even connected to the wall. There's a pane of glass and then an exhibit behind it that can completely come out so we can do whatever we need to do without ever worrying about uh, the animal breaching that exhibit and uh, ending up in the museum. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit today is how we care for some of our uh, venomous species that we keep here at the museum, uh, how we feed them, uh, kind of our husbandry challenges, and also talk a little bit about how these animals are important uh, in North Carolina and why we, uh, why we maybe shouldn't be so threatened by them and even try to protect them a little bit and how we can interact with them and coexist with them in a, in a safe uh, manner. So what we're gonna do, uh, and we'll kind of uh, move around. This is sort of our, uh, our typical routine when we go through and we're cleaning and we're checking on things. Then I will get my food cart. And I do encourage you, as people have questions, uh, please go ahead and bring them up in the chat. I'll be happy to answer questions and talk about things as we work. Uh, I, I, to some extent, I'm capable of multitasking, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. If I, if I need to pause, I'll just uh, pause or maybe I'll pass it off to Shauna so she can uh, answer questions. I also know there's been a, a problem typically with people hearing me with the mask on, so I want to do a quick check and make sure everybody can hear me before I, I go on and start the feeding. Sounds good to me. Thumbs up. All right. Uh, so one of the cool things about some of these snakes, so we keep every, uh, every species of native North Carolina venomous here except for one. Uh, and I don't know if that one has shown up in the uh, the pop quiz uh, that Miranda gave. Uh, yeah, we actually they actually did come up with all six species. Although the one I think you're gonna bring up now was the last one to come up. So that's awesome. Great, uh, and that is the eastern coral snake. Uh, there's a couple reasons we don't keep the eastern coral snake. Uh, one is it's a very reclusive animal, and it's notoriously difficult to keep in captivity. Uh, it's very hard to get it to eat in captivity. Uh, and it's an animal that's very secretive and it wouldn't make for a terribly engaging exhibit because uh, in all likelihood, you would never see it. Um, in fact, when they're kept in a laboratory setting, typically they have to be tube fed um, in places where they, uh, where they milk them for venom. 
Uh, so that's obviously not an animal that uh, we want to have to keep in captivity. It's also an animal that uh, has protected status in North Carolina. It is very close probably to being extirpated from loss of habitat. Uh, so really, it's, it's really that one little pocket down near the coast where you maybe can still find them in the wild in North Carolina. So we wouldn't want to go out and wild collect any of those animals and keep them here at the museum for an exhibit where nobody would even see the animal. Uh, but we do keep all of our native pit vipers, which are the remaining five. And people think of snakes, uh, and typically they think of them as these threatening animals, and we're, we're afraid of all of them. In reality, there's more than 30 species of snake in North Carolina, and of those, there's, uh, there's only six that are venomous, and of those six, uh, four are uncommon enough to be afforded some sort of protected status. Uh, so all of our rattlesnakes are protected in North Carolina to some degree, uh, and also the, the eastern coral snake. So all of our remaining animals are pit vipers. Uh, and pit viper basically means that they have these little sensory pits uh, right between, like around, I wonder if we can get a good zoom in here on this, uh, this rattlesnake coming down here. Uh, she's saying hello. Um, but if we zoom in on the face, you can kind of make out a pit uh, just between the nostril and the eye, kind of lower than the eye level. Uh, if you drew a line straight from the eyeball to the nostril. And those pits detect, uh, detect infrared uh, heat. So it, it's actually really cool to think about because it gets processed in the same area of the brain where vision is processed. So in a way, they see heat uh, and they process it the same way of uh, visual signals are processed. So these guys are pick up very, very uh, well changes in heat and heat signatures. And that's something that we have to think about when we're feeding them is the temperature of the food we're offering. Uh, and also making sure that the food isn't uh, cooler than our hands uh, for, for obvious reasons when we're doing feeding. Uh, however, as you're probably going to see in a minute, the reality of working with venomous animals is when it's done properly and safely, uh, it, it's not terribly exciting to watch, um, at least not when you uh, kind of get used to seeing it. Everything we do here at the museum is done with proper tools, it's done with a two-person system, and we do our best not to take any unnecessary risks. I think in a lot of settings, there's a little bit of showmanship that goes into working with potentially dangerous animals, uh, and we feel that that's never worth the risk when we're working with something that uh, could envenomate somebody or deliver a medically significant bite. Uh, so as you see, when we uh, go around the room, we're going to have uh, a lot of tools that we have to use to stay a safe distance from the animal. Uh, we're never going to put hands on a, a venomous snake and uh, we're gonna feed them with very long palms and grabbers. Uh, if I was going to do a water change or uh, change the substrate on these animals, they would be removed, they'd be put in a locked container. Um, we would never access the enclosure and, and spot clean something with the animal in there and risk a bite. Uh, these animals, some of them could uh, deliver a, a very, very serious uh, bite that could uh, seriously injure somebody, uh, land them in the hospital, or potentially kill them. Uh, so that's definitely something that we want to avoid. So Kurt, we have a question um, from the chat. So Katrina wanted to know, um, when they rattle, are they doing that purely for um, defensive purposes uh, to um, issue a threatening sound, or do, do they also use it in other ways to communicate with potentially one another? Um, rattle is typically a, a defensive display. So it, I think there's still a little bit of a debate in the herpetological community if it's like a, whether it's a get away from me, here's a loud noise, aren't you threatened? or if it's more of a, here's a, a thing waving around that's very loud that isn't going to hurt me if you grab that um, or bite it instead of my head. 
Uh, I have heard it argued both ways, uh, but either way, it's something that they typically do when they feel threatened. Uh, and this girl basically does it if you uh, if she hears you breathe when you walk by. <laughs> she's a she just uh, likes to let you know she's there. She is. She's very uh, aware of people in her space. All right. Everyone really appreciated her um, making that noise is for them. So um, thank you, um, Diamondback Rattles. Um, and uh, Katrina also wants to know how are these animals producing venom? Do they have a special organ? Um, I know that, for example, poison dart frogs get it from the food that they eat. So can you tell us about how um, these venomous reptiles are producing that venom? Right. So they, um, we'll talk a little bit about venom with some of the different things as we go around. Uh, Venom is kind it's an interesting thing that we tend to think of venom as this like single substance that they produce that does a specific thing. And what we're finding out more and more uh, is that venom profiles uh, can actually change uh, between different animals, different localities of that species, uh, different diets uh, can can kind of shift the venom profile as it's basically modified uh, saliva at the end of the day. It's this little cocktail of different proteins and enzymes that cooperate to help the animal catch prey, digest its prey, and in some cases defend themselves. But for the most part, with most venomous species, it's primarily a way for them to catch and consume their prey. Uh, so all of these pit vipers, they have a big gland. Um, with these guys, you can actually uh, kind of see it. Uh, with a rattlesnake, that big bulge that's right behind the eye, um, that's where its venom glands are. And there's a musculature there that when it bites and it uh, delivers venom, will very quickly uh, contract that uh, and there'll be a, it'll expel the venom through a tubular fang. Uh, that folds back in its mouth when it's not in use. So the fang quickly extends, injects the venom through a tubed structure, uh, and then it can retract. And venomous snakes uh, are really, really good at metering the amount of venom they deliver, uh, which a lot of people don't realize. Uh, they, they can control how much venom they deliver based on the size of prey that they're hunting, they can control how uh, they deliver it even from one side to another in some cases. If this snake bit uh, a live prey item out in the wild and it only hit it with one fang and not the other, uh, they can actually regulate to inject that venom through only the one fang. Uh, because it's their only way to catch and consume food in many cases, it's very, very valuable to them because it also takes a lot of energy to produce. So they really don't want to use it unless they have to. And that's why that uh, there's a lot of wives tales about snakes chasing you down and wanting to bite you. Uh, they're, they Really, their brain doesn't have the capacity to uh, chase somebody down maliciously. And even if it did, uh, venom is so important to them that they're only going to use it as a last resort if they can get away from you. In most cases, they're going to try. So when I open this up. This is a cotton mouth. So this is a cotton mouth. Uh, she's a big girl. It's been at the museum since uh, 2014. So these are pre-killed rodents, uh, but uh, they don't know that. They're still going to strike it and consume it the same way they would in the wild. Let's see if I can get it good for camera. Um, she's actually a little bit conditioned. She might just grab it without striking. And we kind of joked that uh, doing this on camera is probably going to ensure that none of them are going to eat today. <laughs> she definitely looks like she is wondering what you're doing and why. 
Like, what's this thing? Because they're so well fed, there are days they decide they just aren't hungry. Right. And that's, I mean, some of these snakes, um, like a large eastern diamondback, like we were just looking at, that's an animal that can survive off one or two meals a year. Uh, it might kill a large rabbit in the spring and eat something that's close to 100% of its body weight and then just kind of shut down uh, for, for the remainder of the year. They don't really need to do much. We're just going to leave that in there for her. So, so she's interested later. Yeah, sometimes we just leave it in there, see if they want it later. Um, sometimes they just want to have a private moment while they're eating. <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll keep trying here because we definitely will have some animals that are a little more hungry. Yeah, we'll we'll actually try with this rattlesnake right now. I promise. Yes. Uh, that she will eat. We'll try with our big um, big sassy girl here. So talking a little bit about the size of prey and how infrequently they need to eat. Uh, when these animals do eat a really, really big meal, that's where their venom helps them also, because it's not just helping them catch the food, it's starting the digestive process early. Uh, once they consume something uh, the size of a rabbit, uh, it's kind of a battle uh, for time, whether or not they can digest that thing before the gut microbes in that rabbit start to cause it to fester inside their stomach. Uh, or their GI tract. So when they inject it with uh, their venom, that venom is already starting to break down tissue and digest that animal from the inside out, which is a really cool adaptation to help these guys in times when uh, food resources might be scarce. Because they're a sit and wait predator, they might have to go a really long time before getting a big meal. Um, where would you like me to stand? So one thing about working with venomous animals, we always have two people, but there has to be a lot of communication. Right. I don't want to accidentally reach somewhere where Kurt is opening a door. Um, I have to make sure that I'm looking at the screen so you guys can see what I'm seeing, but I also have to make sure I'm aware of where my hands are. I'm going to open this end and come in from this side. Okay. Um, so I'm going to have it right here. Okay. So and it's going to basically be biting towards you. Uh, so okay. if you want to stay on this end. Right here? From there, yeah, you okay. get a, a head on view. Sounds good. There's a decent amount of glare, but we will try. Um, so one of the other cool things, well, actually I'll shut up while I'm doing this. <laughs> Okay. Go back a little bit. I don't know if you guys can see, uh, but it's actually the perfect site. Um, if you can see just a little bit there, and see. I apologize, this is a tiny bit gruesome, but you can see right on the top of that rat, uh, the injection site, uh, that's actually venom. Uh, coming out of where uh, the bite happened, that little bit of yellow uh, right there. Um, these guys, part of the reason uh, this is a very, very dangerous snake to humans is not just because of the toxicity of their venom, but the amount of venom that they can deliver. Uh, this animal, you can kind of see on the head there, those are really big venom glands. Uh, and this animal probably delivers somewhere in the realm of a tablespoon of venom when it bites something. Uh, so that amount uh, is going to be really, really uh, problematic because uh, it's the type of venom that immediately starts digesting you, essentially. It's, it's breaking down connective tissue versus a neurotoxic uh, or a more neurotoxic venom that's causes kind of organ shutdown and things like that that you would be more worried about with the eastern coral snake. Uh, all of these pit vipers have uh, a little bit more of a hematoxic venom profile that because of that, uh, a lot of our emergency protocols are written with the idea of time is tissue in mind. Everything is about getting the person to the hospital as quickly as possible because there is nothing we can do that is more important to save that person's tissue 
and prevent tissue damage than getting them somewhere where a trained physician can deliver antivenin. And Miranda, if we have time at the end, we can come back and watch her actually consume the rat. Um, she's more concerned about us yeah, yeah, being in exactly. front of her right now than eating the rat. She's, you know, protecting her her kill here. Oh, 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 oh. The cottonmouth is eating. Oh, and the cottonmouth was the just waiting for us to leave. Yeah, <laughs> she did want a private moment. Yeah. So you can see it kind of going down the hatch. And I have to say that I got to watch. Um, you put the rat in the Diamondbacks um, cage two times, and I did not see it strike either time. So that's how fast it was. It was so amazing. Fast. Fast. Yeah, they are so fast. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to see it better when we can uh, watch one of these guys start eating from the beginning. Uh, but I don't know how many uh, people on the chat there, maybe we can do a, a, a virtual show of hands, that have heard that snakes can unhinge their jaw to swallow their prey. Uh, it's not technically true. It, it's uh, it's sort of half true in that uh, they have a very kinetic jaw. So that that little space where if you touch your chin, uh, where you feel uh, that uh, that lower mandible is just very rigid. It's all one piece. Whereas in snakes, their lower mandible uh, is two pieces on the right and left side that's connected by a little ligament where their chin would be. And they also don't, they have some extra bones, uh, probably uh, derived from uh, the loss of ear bones that uh, connect those uh, mandibles to the, to the skull uh, case. So they can move all of those pieces independently of each other, which is a huge benefit uh, when you can't use gravity or your hands to get food down your throat. So they have these little uh, hooked teeth that hook inwards and they can slowly walk, um, kind of walk their head over their food or I guess walk the food down their mouth, whichever way you prefer to think about it as they're eating. Awesome. And she's already done. Already done. Yeah, so we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, so since that snake just ate, they wanted to know, um, do, can you see something in their body after they eat? Because obviously they're kind of a long, slim tube, right? And so when they eat something big, like those big rats, um, you can see it, right? It's a kind of a big lump. Yeah. Sometimes, um, we, we call it a food bolus when, when you can see kind of a, a, a mass there in their GI tract afterwards. And it really depends on the size of meal that they eat. Um, if one of these snakes were to eat a really big meal, yeah, you'd be able to notice it if you were looking at them. Uh, but they're actually so muscular that sometimes it's hard to tell. It really does compact and elongate uh, that meal in such a way that uh, unless it's something really big, I always like to think of that, uh, that bit from the little prince with the boa constrictor over the elephant, uh, unless it's something really, really large where it's fairly obvious, uh, it might be hard to tell. And uh, it, it really depends on the, the type of snake and uh, the type of body. These are very thick bodied snakes, rattlesnakes. Uh, so sometimes it can be uh, hard to see that, especially when they're coiled and half under leaves. Uh, so right now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our exhibits and how we access them. So uh, as we open this, and I'll let Shauna get on uh, the other side of this um, so we can actually see inside when we're doing it, uh, we're probably going to see some of the public out there because we are open to the public and there might be people in front of the, the snake wall. Um, when we're feeding this, obviously, I can't see what's going on in there. So. Uh, there are ways that we could look over the top and see where the snake is, but really the best thing is to always assume that the snake's just decided he's gonna climb this wall and it's sitting right here waiting for me to open the door and it's gonna come flopping out. Uh, so even when I open these doors, I'm always opening it with tools. I'm being very careful, uh, just like you would want to do if you were out rock climbing in Western North Carolina, watch where you put your hands. <laughs> like, uh, it's the same for an exhibit, it's the same outdoors. Uh, so I'm going to open this very slowly, um, watch what I'm doing, and make sure, uh, even if the snake was sitting right here, that I'm always outside of the strike range of that animal. Uh, 
especially during feeding time uh, when that animal uh, probably hasn't had anything to eat in a couple weeks and it's, it's good and ready. Uh, the other thing is uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we handle our venomous protocols if there was an emergency. And it's something that we take a lot of pride in, that we're, we're very careful about the way uh, we look at envenomation. Like I said, we always use a two-person system. Um, if Shauna wasn't in here with me, I wouldn't even be opening venomous exhibits right now. And we have cage starts for everything that's venomous. Uh, we have a very specific safety uh, radio protocol. Uh, and this would go with me all the way to the hospital if I were bitten. And what this tells the emergency room is exactly what bit me, um, information on antivenin, which thankfully uh, it would be the same antivenin for any of our venomous snakes that we have here. And that antivenin, because it's typically the antivenin used for uh, copperhead envenomation, it's in generally uh, every major hospital in North Carolina because copperheads uh, occur pretty much in every county in North Carolina. Uh, but it's also good for the physician to have that information because a physician in Wake County may have never seen an Eastern Diamondback uh, envenomation because they're just not that common. And that will influence their treatment and how they administer antivenin because it's going to be very different from a, uh, a snake that size uh, versus a copperhead. So when I open this up, I'm gonna get another. So this is the back of our big Eastern Diamondback exhibit. If anybody's been to the museum, you've definitely seen this one on the snake wall. So Kurt and Shauna, if we have some people who are local to the Raleigh area or just want to make a trip to the museum and want to see the snakes on exhibit eating, is there a good time of the week or the month that they can come and try to catch that? Or is it kind of random? Nope. Uh, if we, uh, we, we stick to a loose schedule uh, because we have to consider staffing uh, with our feeding because we have to have venomous uh, staff on hand uh, to do the venomous feeding. We try not to stick to or commit to a rigid, uh, they're gonna be fed on this day at this time schedule because we can't ensure that we're going to have the venomous staff uh, to do it. Uh, but we also, uh, are very careful about flexing that schedule with things that go on in downtown Raleigh. Uh, one of the things we think about is whether or not an ambulance would actually be able to get here if there was an envenomation. So if there's a big event or a protest or a holiday parade in the downtown plaza that might uh, make it hard for an ambulance to get in front of the museum, we're simply not going to feed venomous animals that day and push it to the next day or the day before. So it's one of those things that we try to schedule in a way that uh, we're keeping safety in mind uh, as well as the animal's well-being. And all of our snakes have very different schedules. Some eat every week, some eat every two weeks, some eat every month. Right. So it really depends on the animal's age and size. And sometimes we just look at behavior as well. Some animals need a little more food or it looks like they haven't eaten in a while. So we adjust accordingly. Right. Uh, and sometimes it's uh, influenced by uh, treatment that our vet uh, services are trying to do. If they're trying to uh, deliver medications or something uh, specifically for a food item. Of course, my phone's going to ring. <laughs> Apologies. So I don't know uh, how easy this is to see. Um, but when we're accessing these exhibits, uh, actually, oh, here we go. I'm going to hold this while I do it so you guys can get a bird's eye view. Uh, you can just kind of see right in the um, my right hand uh, corner of that log, the head poking out. Uh, she's good and interested. Uh, and she's right there. And that's actually kind of interesting. That's the way they would uh, sort of hunt in the wild. They would wait right there for something to go across a log and then... Uh, and then grab a squirrel uh, as it ran across. So I'm gonna see if I can get a nice like aerial shot as we're doing this. There we go. 
Sorry, did that show up? <laughs> I think we just missed the action yeah. shot, Kurt. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's almost impossible to do this with Ben's, uh, yourself just because of safety issues. Um, but now she's looking at you like, leave me alone. I'm going to yeah. eat this. Mm -hmm. it's not so close. <laughs> so close. Very camera shy. Yeah. <laughs> So I am going to lock that up, and then we're going to move on to our timber rattlesnake. Uh, now, this is a snake that uh, you, a rattlesnake that's a little bit more common than the diamondback. It tends to be smaller. Uh, there's, um, you can find them in the western part of the state. You can also find them uh, more down near the coast. And uh, there's some some color variation too in this species. Um, this one on exhibit is one of the lighter colored animals. And what you might get to see is just how difficult they are to see uh, when you're uh, walking around. Because uh, our exhibit is mostly leaf litter on the bottom. So as we're Looking at this, we'll be able to see just how well it kind of blends into its surrounding. Ooh, she is out. Yep, is right there waiting. She is enthused. And she might, there we go. Very gentle. She did a very civilized strike yes. there. I don't know if you guys um, saw that. That was downright dainty, I yeah. would say. <laughs> Yeah, we did see that one. That was that was a good strike. I think she must have heard what was going on next door. She looked ready. Yeah. And that that strike was uh, again. It was very civilized. Sometimes we have snakes strike, and it's just like this huge, dramatic, big strike. Yeah, they're um, they're surprisingly uncoordinated animals. Sometimes <laughs> they get enthusiastic and they'll just fling their whole body at food. Uh, I feel like our uh, water snakes, like the red belly water snakes, are a great example of animals that just fly all over the place when you go to feed them. <laughs> right, I'm actually going to get um, the little baby book. So, okay. Kurt, you mentioned that the timber rattlesnake has um, those two distinct color variations. What is the, the reason for those um, color variations within the same species? Good question. Um, I imagine it, it, it is more uh, related to uh, camouflage and blending in with its surroundings. Um, I am actually not that well informed on that. So uh, if somebody wants to do a, a deep dive into that information, uh, they are welcome to do so. Uh, it may come up in one of the other uh, reptile and amphibian day talks. Uh, so you'll have to attend those. So, <laughs> These guys, uh, these are two pygmy rattlesnakes. These were actually born here at the museum. Uh, they are brothers. Uh, and just like brothers, they have a tendency to fight over their meals. Uh, so we're actually going to pull one out while we feed. Uh, we have to separate them because they'll, they will get overly enthusiastic and uh, sometimes they do uh, try to bite each other. So... What we will do here, and I'll kind of show you how we move these guys around. Uh, they are fairly uncoordinated, again, so uh, they don't really want to stay on the hooks. They have a tendency to fall off. Head, lock that guy up. And then we're going to offer this guy a mouse. Let's see if I can get in there. There we yeah, go. How visible is that? Pretty good. You can go, yeah, to the right. Perfect. Little, ooh, that was a good strike. And these are full grown adults. A lot of people don't realize we have uh, rattlesnakes this small in North Carolina. Uh, and they're so small uh, that. 
their rattle is actually kind of hard to hear. Um, if they start rattling and doing that defensive display, it almost just sounds like a bee buzzing around you. Uh, another great reason to watch where you're stepping. You can see this little guy up close here. Looks like this one knows what's happening. <laughs> so you see that these guys strike and then they kind of leave it for a few minutes because in the wild that's them waiting for the animal to not be alive anymore before they eat it. So the last one we're going to do over here, snake-wise, uh, this is everybody's favorite, uh, is the copperhead, which is the bearer of so much misplaced, uh, misplaced hatred, unfortunately. We'll see where he's at, yeah. and you can decide where I can stand. Um, and so Katrina noticed that um, out of the venomous snakes you've shown us so far, um, you had two individuals um, of the pygmy rattlesnake. Is that because they are tend to be more social or um, what's going on there? Not necessarily. Um, that was, uh, I think that was more of a decision that was made by uh, the person who put the exhibit together uh, several years ago. Uh, because we had several animals born here at once, they wanted to show uh, two in the same enclosure that were the same age. Uh, and they do, uh, we have to separate them to feed, but they do get along pretty well uh, in the same place. Uh, the other ones, it's really just a matter of size compared to enclosure, uh, that we don't want to put two big animals in a uh, smaller enclosure. Uh, so we try to keep them individually isolated. It's also something that uh, at the request of our veterinary services, we try to maintain biosecurity as much as possible, meaning we're not going to mix a whole bunch of animals unnecessarily if there was any sort of pathogenic concern uh, or an animal health issue that we had to address. Uh, we like to know that it's relatively contained. Uh, if we have to isolate and quarantine and treat one animal uh, while we do sort of investigative medicine, it's it's a lot better to do that with one than have to do that with five animals uh, because you don't really know what you're dealing with. It's also safety for us. Those bigger snakes have a much bigger range. They have bigger strike range. Right. And having two in one enclosure for us to keep an eye on and not you know, make sure we're out of strike range would make things a little more challenging for us as well. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and if you're, if you're feeding snakes and they're in that feed response, and they're just firing in every direction. Uh, you don't want to be the person there uh, juggling rats when there's uh, that amount going on. So uh, that's another reason, definitely, that we try to keep them out singly. Uh, so this, this is our copperhead. And uh, if you live in Wake County, um, this is the venomous snake you are going to see 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Uh, personally, I think they are beautiful animals, but I know uh, a lot of people do not feel the same. They, uh, well, they are, people rarely die from copperhead bites. It's actually very, very uncommon, uh, but it is still a medically significant bite. If this animal were to bite you for, please seek medical attention. Um, it can be very painful, uh, and it is a, uh, a toxin that damages connective tissue, like the rest of these uh, people lose fingers, people lose hands, um, and it can be uh, very damaging uh, to the bite area and the whole body, really. Uh, but it's also a bite that's, that can be avoided fairly easily. Uh, one of the one of the things I love to tell people is a vast majority of envenomations in North Carolina happen when the person 
saw the snake and identified the snake and made the decision uh, to try and move or kill that animal uh, and then resultingly become envenomated. Uh, and that's avoidable by just leaving the animal be. In most cases, these are fairly reclusive animals. You may never see it again. And uh, also in most cases, when given the option, it's gonna try to get away from you rather than bite defensively. Uh, so leave it alone and you're, it's safer for the animal and it's safer for you ultimately. And these snakes do up, they do occupy a very important ecological niche in North Carolina. Uh, we do need our snakes. And if uh, they all die due to uh, human on snake violence, it is uh, definitely unfortunate. How are we doing? Ooh, that's a good strike. Yeah, I have to say, I live in Cary, North Carolina. Um, right off of US 1 and Walnut Street. And I see copperheads in my yard every single year. I have two dogs and two toddlers. I usually see them in the kind of in the evening right after the sun goes down. Um, I have a lot of cicadas that come up in my yard. And I learned that copperheads love to eat cicadas, especially freshly molted ones. Um, so I've seen them climbing my fence to try to grab some cicadas that are molting. I've seen one eating a cicada on my walkway. And usually I'd say 90% of the time when I see one, um, I say, oh, there's a copperhead outside. Let's not let the dogs up for a few minutes. And I go back in and 20 seconds later, I go back out and the copperhead is nowhere to be seen. So um, <laughs> I feel perfectly fine with them living in my yard. I have lots of leaf litter that I'm sure they're bunking down in. Um, but yeah, I've never, you know, and usually when they're standing still and not moving and running away from me, it's because I think that there's more afraid of me. But as soon as we leave the area, they um, escape. So, Right. And I, uh, I like to tell people I, I also have a small child. So uh, I, I was very careful that there be more than 30 species in North Carolina. I don't want to teach him all the things that it might look like a copperhead. First, I taught him what a copperhead looked like and to just leave it alone. Uh, and that that has gone pretty well. I, it, it was my proudest moment as a parent so far when he uh, recognized the copperhead uh, in our yard. So uh, so one of the other things I wanted to show you, this is one of the non-native venomous animals that we keep back here. We actually keep two species of venomous lizard uh, at the museum. So these are Gila monsters. Uh, uh, we keep these and we also keep uh, Mexican beaded lizards. Uh, these guys kind of, uh, they, they are protected species. Uh, they're, they're found in kind of the Sonoran Desert region uh, from well, Utah through Arizona, uh, getting just down into Mexico, whereas the beaded lizards are more uh, all through Mexico towards Guatemala, uh, so a lot more Southern. Uh, they are also a lot more arboreal, whereas these guys are uh, ground dwellers. Uh, one of the cool things about these guys, uh, their venom strategy is a, a bit different than the pit vipers. Uh, and I will actually. Um, That one seems a little grumpy. Yeah, a little, little grouchy. Doesn't, doesn't want to be woken up. Um, whereas you're just being a little sweetie. Uh, so these guys, I don't know how well you can see, but their mandible area down there, um, trying to move around on me, that mandible, the way it's kind of puffed up, they have a big venom gland uh, on their lower jaw and the mandible. And when they bite, the it, rather than having a tubular fang, it kind of flows down uh, these grooved fangs on their lower jaw, and they sort of chew and mash it into their food, and it coats them out. And these are actually a species where, because of their diet, um, there's a school of thought that these are uh, 
Venom is primarily more of a defense mechanism in these guys. It's a very uh, painful uh, neurotoxic venom that is, uh, because they eat mostly small ground-dwelling birds and tiny mammals, it can't really get away from them. Uh, we suspect that it may be more of a defense mechanism at this point. But these guys are also um, very, very well adapted for the re area they live in and occupy uh, because of their value. It, they have a, you know, is a little bit of scrambled egg. Baby chick. Uh, because of the area that they live in, uh, step in. these really uh, arid desert regions, um, they may only come across uh, food that is, you know, half of their body weight uh, once in uh, like four or five months when they, they come out in spring, uh, they uh, look for nests from ground-dwelling uh, quail, uh, they gorge themselves on a nest of eggs that's half their body weight, uh, and they need to be able to survive off that for potentially a long period of time. Uh, and we think one of the things that helps them do that is uh, a protein in their venom uh, that kind of regulates uh, absorption of glucose. And AstraZeneca has actually been able to use that uh, kind of an artificially synthesized version of that to make a drug used to treat type 2 diabetes uh, to regulate uh, the secretion of insulin in humans. Uh, so these guys, uh, this is one of those cases where venom has actually been useful uh, to humans uh, and a lot of humans. And she's just enjoying her raw egg. <laughs> They are so amazing and so beautiful. Um, and we noticed that you handled this venom animal um, a lot differently than you did the snake. Right. Um, and this is, uh, first of all, this animal is uh, fairly used to this. Um, I would not encourage anybody to do that out in the wild. Uh, firstly, because it's illegal uh, to pick one up out in the wild. Secondly, uh, because uh, they, they could bite you in it and it could be very uh, painful and damaging. Uh, this animal, uh, we've, we work with it a lot. Uh, we have a, a handling protocol. And I, you could see I was, I was handling her in a way that my hand uh, was never in a, a dangerous place. <laughs> kind of playing with their food a little. <laughs> Yeah, yep. yeah, we've, um, I know you guys have fed <laughs> these animals for, for us, um, for our programs before, and they always bring me so much joy because they are a little bit goofy looking when they're, <laughs> when they're eating, I think. Yeah. Uh, they we, just get filthy too. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, we These guys in particular, we like to feed them in a uh, separate container because uh, you can see she is going to fling this around and make an absolute mess. Uh, she's also going to immediately defecate uh, after she eats that. Um, and if anyone's ever smelled the feces of an animal that eats nothing but raw eggs and poultry, uh, it's not great. Uh, so being able to clean it right afterwards is kind of nice. They also don't seem to mind uh, coming out to eat. They're, they're always ready to eat. And she's gonna just drag it out and lick it. <laughs> uh, do we have any uh, questions that we can answer while we're watching this? Yeah, I think so. So um, I know that um, lots of people in this area, their dogs are bitten by, um, especially copperheads in you know local to Wake County and Raleigh. Um, and so it's a the same kind of situation for. For, for animals, for dogs, if they were to be um, envenomated, um, potentially by a copperhead or a venomous snake, just get them to the to the vet right away, right? All right, and I'll uh, just I'll say as a disclaimer, I'm not a vet, um, so mm -hmm. uh, this is coming from a somebody who is not a licensed veterinarian. Uh, 
but I would say if my dog was bitten by a copperhead, I would take it to that immediately. Uh, it can be painful. It can be damaging. There are things that, uh, there, there are treatments that they can provide, even if just for pain management. Uh, the good news is it, uh, it's a lot cheaper uh, to treat uh, copperhead envenomation in a dog than it is for people. Uh, the, the thing I always uh, tell people is a cautionary for uh, being around uh, copperheads is that the worst thing is how expensive it is to receive a copperhead bite. Uh, Anti-venom treatment, hospital stay, uh, it, 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 it will cost you a lot of money. Um, so best just not to pick it up because um, it'll be painful to uh, your person and your wallet. Uh, whereas with these guys um, or dogs, um, typically it, it's, they, they tend to handle it a lot better than humans. Yeah, and Miranda, um, I actually had my dog bit by a copperhead uh, right when I moved to North Carolina, and he was 13 years old, and I took him to the vet, and um, they actually just test, they do blood tests that are really important to make sure the dog's still clotting properly, and the venom hasn't done anything to their ability to heal, and they, then they just treated him for pain, so he actually didn't get anti-venom. He did recover fully from that bite, but he was in a lot of pain. So, you know, going to the vet's really important for a lot of reasons. Um, again, we're not veterinarians, so I knew I needed to take my dog immediately to the vet, but he did recover fully. That's a, that's a cool experience. Um, I mean, not a cool experience, but it's a cool story that you could share that with us. Yeah, yeah. It was I want to thank you. I know. I know for certain, yeah. I know for certain that if my dog were to be bitten by a, a venomous, uh, by a copperhead, it would be on his face because um, I that's how have, I found him looking at other snakes, like a little brown snake. He just was kind of nosing it. So I know that if he ever detected a, a copperhead, he would nose it and for sure be bitten on the face. So I would worry about respiratory swelling. Um Absolutely. And one thing, you know, the veterinarian was so wonderful and all the veterinarians in North Carolina have seen copperhead bites on dogs. So it's very common here. Your vet will know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And so Meg was asking, how do you know what they need in their food? So obviously you're feeding um, the Gila monster, um, you know, not a mouse or a rat, like you were feeding the snakes. Um, though we do sometimes feed them small uh, mammals. We just try to add a little bit of diversity in their diet when we can. Uh, we don't want to give them, um, unless it's something, an animal that really specializes on one type of prey, uh, we don't want to give it the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, because that's one way you can end up with uh, nutritional deficiencies if uh, you're, you're overfeeding uh, a single food item. Um, I think all the paying, time. Yeah, I think paying attention to natural history is really important when we make the diets and also working very closely with the veterinarian that has uh, training on nutritional, um, like what their nutritional needs are in captivity. So some nutritional needs are hard for us to replicate in captivity. So a veterinarian is really important to work with to make sure that we're getting any extra vitamins and minerals we actually have to add a vitamin to any frozen fish that we feed out to any of our animals that eat fish, because when you, once you freeze a fish, it loses a ton of that vitamin, a lot of the vitamins that it would have in the wild. So we actually do add to some of our, um, we dust things with calcium consistently. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we do to make sure they get the right diet. Right. And that's always a challenge dealing with exotic species as uh, diet formulation is if you wanted to go out and get a, a, a well-formulated commercial diet for your dog or cat, that's fairly easy to find. Uh, some of these animals like a uh, Gila monster, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to find uh, good resources and good information on diet, nutrition, and husbandry. Uh, so one thing, it's very important for us to uh, maintain good relationships with other institutions uh, so we can get some of that information from other zoos, aquariums, science centers that uh, keep these animals in captivity. 
Uh, the other thing is, like Shauna said, working with our vet staff and constantly assessing uh, our nutrition protocols. When these animals go get their annual exams, that's something we tend to talk about is, is this animal, uh, is their body condition looking good? What's their feeding regimen? Uh, what are they eating? Uh, it, are there any changes we need to make? And veterinarians will actually take blood and do panels to make sure there aren't any deficiencies that are really, um, you know, obvious. <laughs> yeah, and we're we're also fairly spoiled here at the museum. I, I actually think they're uh, doing a program today uh, with some of our reptiles and amphibians, but we're very lucky to have on-site veterinary staff that is full-time to the museum uh, that uh, only works with our animals uh, and is very familiar with all of those patients uh, and is only, you know, a five minutes away uh, if we need to radio them because we're worried about something. So we're kind of spoiled in that respect, uh, but it, it's something we definitely enjoy having and it's a luxury a lot of zoos don't even have. Yeah, that's true. And we actually do have a program today at two o'clock um, with our veterinary staff. They're going to be doing an exam on the um, emerald tree boas that we have at the museum. All right. Um, well, so I'm going to reverse this. So, hey, you guys, that's Shauna. Um, <laughs> so if there's anything uh, we can uh, walk around and show people in the room, too, as part of a question, I don't know how we're doing on time. I just assume Miranda will yell at me uh, <laughs> if we go over. Um, yeah, we are getting close to time now. Have a few minutes left. All right, uh, so if there's anything in the chat that people want to see closure or any uh, burning questions, please uh, go ahead and fire those and we'll be, we'll be happy to answer. I think we've got pretty much everything. Um, Katrina did ask, how are their bodies adapted to prevent salmonella from the raw egg? I know that's something that we as humans have to worry about. Um, so can you tell us maybe a little bit? That'll be the last question, I think. Right, uh, well, so all reptiles actually have salmonella in their gut. Um, and I like to tell people too, like uh, as somebody who has a small child, uh, treat every reptile basically the same way you would treat a raw piece of chicken. Uh, wash your hands after you pick it up. Uh, don't uh, don't lick your fingers after you handle a snake, uh, and maybe don't let your your five year old uh, uh, touch an animal or touch a reptile. But there's a couple good reasons for that. Uh, but it's it's actually interesting. It's a new uh, it's kind of a new uh, area of research that we're kind of getting into. Uh, not us at the museum, but uh, herpetological researchers in general, we don't know a lot about the gut microbes of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, and we're just starting to get into that territory with mammals and humans and understanding how our gut flora uh, interact with our bodies uh, in really interesting, uh, complicated ways. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how that works with reptiles in the future. Because uh, there's a lot of animals with very uh, unique dietary uh, strategies in the herpetological world. Animals that eat once a year and eat a huge meal um, and specialize on very specific things. There are snakes that only eat eggs. There are snakes that eat mostly frogs. Uh, there's some species of snake that eat nothing but one type of centipede. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of uh, unique feeding strategies that uh, really need further research. Very cool. Hopefully um, that inspires someone to do their own research and possibly even um, pursue a career in, in researching these animals. So um, very cool. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Shauna, for um, putting this program on. Um, Meg said it was their favorite program of all. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we've had a lot so far. We have more coming up, of course, including the two o'clock vet program. So please join us for that. Um, I do want to thank you all too for joining us for this program. We hope to see you at more. Um, if you are a member of the museum, thank you so much. And if not, um, look into joining us as a friend of the Museum of Natural Sciences. And um, you know, check out our website, naturalsciences.org. Click on Reptile and Amphibian Day to check out the upcoming programs um, today, tomorrow, and Saturday. And we hope to see you at more. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.